Giovanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everyone. I don't know who's there, but hopefully some, some familiar faces. Um, it's really exciting to be here. As Stephen mentioned, I did come to New York City in 2015 from Mexico City um, to start this program. And it was really such an important introduction uh, to so many of the ideas, concepts, and thinkers that uh, were very influential for my practice as a curator. Um, many of the professors that were at SVA, I got to work with, such as Brian Kwan Wood, Maria Lind, uh, Sofia Hernandez Chonkui, and they were incredible mentors um, and colleagues now. So it was, yeah, it was very, very important. Um, and so I'm really, yeah, I'm just happy to be here and be able to go back. I'm starting actually with with some ideas for my thesis project because I thought it would be interesting to to go back to that, especially given the program and it's still taking place in the same um, in the same venue. So I'll show a little bit of that um, to contextualize. But I basically grew up in a part of the world where power dynamics were incredibly marked. Uh, it's a place where two very different worlds collide, and that is the US-Mexico border. Um, so artists there were really trying to understand the social and the political dimension of the place through works that probed history and critique specific systems um, and really try to make sense of it, often with humor, abstraction, and poetics. And so this place really shaped my worldview and many of the artists and artworks that I'm drawn to, um, which I would say include various forms and aesthetics of dissent and refusal, often employed through an interaction with the body. Um, and so I'm also drawn to artists, practices that address the condition of the world. And so in line with that, I wanted, like I said, to start off with some images of my thesis exhibition that was looking at liminal states and in-between states at sites of potential across a group of artists working internationally. Um, and I was really interested back then and even now of putting artists across various geographies in conversation with one another. And so here um, I wanted to, it, it was in the Pfizer building. So some of the students will recognize this place and so hopefully some others will go to see the thesis shows because I actually find it a very exciting place to make a project in. We will you know, as curators, then we really start to work in, in more traditional white cube spaces. So it's fun to play with a more non-traditional space. And so in that space, because if we could also do it, I wanted to evoke the sensation of an in-between state as club space. And so I put a fog machine um, in the middle of the, <laughs> in the middle of the exhibition space to kind of create this, the sensation, this darkness of, of this in-betweenness. Um, and so there were works by Barbara Sanchez Gain, who's now featured in the Venice Biennial, um, has pretty major sculptures in, in the show now, so you can see her work. She's now um, showing across many places, but I showed her because I thought that her work with fashion, with clothing, really kind of evoked this sensation of the in-between through gender and through the body and through clothing. And I also had a live performance uh, by Cienfuegos to kind of give a soundtrack to the, to the opening night. There was also kind of a major work by Hee Chon Kim, who was an artist that I met when I was an intern at the Gwangju Biennial in 2016. And I met him in Korea and I wanted to feature him. And he's now also uh, won the Hermes Foundation Prize. So he's got a major show in Seoul. If anybody um, is is there, please go see that. It's, it's quite good. He's evolved a lot in his video work practice. Um, and so after I graduated, shortly after that, I was hired at SFMOMA, which is where I spent the last six years of my uh, career working with um, an incredible mentor and curator, Unji Ju, who was hired essentially to start a new department at SFMOMA that was a contemporary art department. Like other, um, like other museums, the curatorial departments are divided by medium. So there was architecture and design, painting and sculpture, photography, uh, media arts, and um, I think that's it, the four. And then, so so she was hired on to start this contemporary art department that really focused on international art. Um, and so it was exciting because we started this new department that was really focused in a way on commissioning new work by artists that were across geographies. And she 
had worked um, on the New Museum Triennial at Inochin in, in Brazil, um, had organized the Charger Biennial and the Anyang Public Art Project in Korea. And I had been working um, across institutions in Mexico City. Again, I had done the internship with Maria Lind in Guangzhou, so I had that experience. Um, also did internships when I was in New York at the at the Whitney, um, at the Colección Felipe, the Patricia Febs de Cisneros collection. So I had, with both of us combined, um, we had, you know, this kind of interest in um, international contemporary art and commissioning specifically. And so when the time that I spent at SFMOMA, um, we worked on, with Unji, I worked on over seven exhibitions and projects. Again, the vast majority were, were new commissions. I worked on four exhibitions on my own. Um, so in total over 11 projects, as well as many public programs. Um, and we also were able to start an acquisitions committee. And so that was also really important because many of the commissions that we worked on, we were able to bring into the collection and shape the collection in that way. And so overall, while, while during my time there, we brought over 200 works into the collection. So those six years were really um, important. They were kind of an education for me as well on working with artists on a new project, um, on really identifying what that meant for them at that, their, that stage in their career and what it really meant for San Francisco, for the museum, for the city. Um, and so I wanted to show a couple of those projects that I worked on with NG because I, like I said, those were my other master's program in, in commissioning and really working with a large institution. Um, SFOMA at that time had around 350 team members. We were two working mostly in the department. We later got some help um, maybe two years in my time there. So I started as administrative assistant and curatorial assistant and because of the intensity of the workload and you know the, the way that I got to work with Unji, I ended my time there as associate curator, which was I think quite rare at a big institution to get those type of promotions. But it was really because I got to have a lot of hands-on experience working on exhibitions. And so this is an example of one of those projects that we did. There was a there is a space dedicated to new work called the New Work Gallery um, that shows about three has about three exhibitions a year. And so we, that was the space that we, that Unji really oversaw and that we got to, to work on mostly. And this is a project by Roddy McMillan, who's an artist based in Los Angeles, who came to San Francisco um, and wanted to do this large scale landscape painting to think about the history of landscape uh, and the American landscape specifically in regards to um, the situation that was happening that is very much present still in San Francisco and across various cities in, in the US, which has to do with um, people experiencing homelessness. And so, you know, something that, that I do with artists now based off of so much of the experience that I had is that when an artist comes to do a site visit, for example, uh, we would ask, you know, who is it that you want to meet? Who is it that you want to, is there any area specifically in the city that you would like to explore? you know, to get them thinking around the project beyond kind of the confines of the of the museum space itself. So Rodney really wanted to talk to um, organizations that were working on the homelessness issue. And so I set up, you know, as part of my role, meetings with about seven organizations. And then in the speakers that you see, there is an interview with Tamika Moss, who was the, the kind of head of an organization called Hamilton Families that specifically was helping families um, who were experiencing homelessness, um, you know, find housing. So all of these projects, um, especially with commissioning, they're very, again, they, they're specific, they're exciting for me because you get to dive into a very specific theme, topic that the artist would like to explore within kind of the city or within their practice. Um, and then we have the, the major exhibition that we worked on for over two years was Soft Power. And Soft Power was an exhibition that Unji worked on that, that had conceptualized around the artist as citizen and thinking through the role of the artist um, in terms of this, this notion of soft power. So it was very much in line you know, with, with many of the ideas that I think around art as well. And so it was exciting to work on this project with 20 artists. They were all 
many were based in the US, but mostly international. And out of the 20 artists, the vast majority, I would say 90% of them did new commissions. So it was, again, really important to think through the specificities of each of them, uh, what they needed to accomplish within the time that we had, um, and also working with them internationally. So, so it had to do with also long conversations um, with them across geographies to really get to something that made sense for them and for the, for the space in San Francisco. So here you, you know, just to show a few examples of that, there's work by Haga Bazian, who's an artist based in Beirut that was merging this, um, these kind of relics from past empires with new landmarks of cultural uh, diplomacy that included in the back, you can see this miniaturized um, model of the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, and then we have works by Eamon Oregiron, who's now showing in a lot of, uh, who recently showed at the Whitney Biennial, but in, in major exhibitions. And this was the first time that Eamon went, um, did some of these paintings from his Infinite Regress series at this large scale. So, you know, I think that when we work on a commission, even now, it's important to really talk to the artists and understand what they would like to do, what's kind of the next uh, chapter in their in their practice that we as an institution, as a curator can really support, can really work closely with um, to accomplish and to, to, to get there. In the back, there's also works by Tavar Stran that was not a new commission, but it was a major rehang of several of his works. And then here are, are so the the it was spread across two floors of SF MoMA, so the seventh floor and the fourth floor in the Boda building, and it was over around twenty thousand square feet. So it was major um, kind of footprint in the museum, and it was really this intention by the by SF MoMA to emphasize their their kind of interest in international and contemporary art, and so something that NG did that was really exciting too was that there were no walls essentially or, or a lot of the, the walls had been knocked down so a lot of the works um, by, by artists were in conversation with one another here in this image on the left you can see works by Marwa Arsanios also based between uh, Beirut and Washington Nikhil Chopra based in Goa and in India in the background there's Ivaria Simmons who's based here in New York Chaya Pintong, who's in uh, Thailand, and then Dave McKenzie on the left. So it was really kind of um, this, this dialogue across, across the works. And then on the top part, this was on the seventh floor. On the left, on the right side, you see works by Dineo Sasha Bopape, who's based in Johannesburg, that wanted to do a major kind of installation of soil. And so this was this kind of seating arrangement in the dark with the soil cube thinking around kind of, or playing with the, the minimal, minimalism, um, but with, um, of course, with soil and with earth, um, with that material. And then there was a major installation as well by Cynthia Marcelli, who's an artist based in, in Sao Paulo, that was essentially lowering the, the ceiling and playing with this um, kind of notion of, of an office space and the, the oppressiveness maybe of these types of structures. And so she has this this same installation now has been rehung at the current Gwangju Biennial. So if anybody's there, you will be able to see it again. But it was commissioned by by Asafoma. And then this was an existing work, but I wanted to show it because it was actually a work that was commissioned by Sculpture Center, which is the institution where I am now, but we showed it um, as part of Soft Power. This is by Nari Bagramian. Um, and Nairi, like many of the artists in the exhibition, uh, had several works in the show, not just one. Um, so you could kind of see a practice um, more kind of fully or completely versus having a major group show with, with um, kind of smaller works by the artists instead included major works and double works by, by uh, several of the artists. And then so during that too, um, you know, the pandemic happened in 2020. And as you know, many museums were really rethinking what their role was within the city, but also as institutions, what their collections meant, what type of exhibitions they were showing. And so something that SFOMA thought was important to do at that time was to commission local artists 
um, to make new work, specifically because uh, we wanted to find a way to support artists, um, to kind of nurture still some of the um, some of the artists that were there. You know, San Francisco has many cities, but San Francisco was going through a very difficult time. Um, the city shut down completely, as as other cities did. But I think the difference with San Francisco was that, um, you know, the economy was so much based off of of um, many of the tech workers that were there and about um, 40,000 people left San Francisco during the pandemic. So there was this kind of exodus of, of people, which in a way was something that um, I think, you know, many of us had wanted for, for the tech people to leave so that there was like this, this um, balance of the economy, but the rents never actually lowered. So it was a very kind of expensive city um, with this also sense, sense of abandonment. And I think only now, you know, four years later, it's in that state of recovery. But in line with that, like I said, we wanted to uh, commission artists by Bay Area, Bay Area artists to, to really um, kind of support them. And so one of the artists that I proposed was Liz Hernandez, who made this mural um, called Conjuro para la Sanación de Nuestro Futuro, which translates as a spell for the healing of our future, because she was really thinking about um, these um, kind of miracle charms that one places onto the statues of saints in churches, specifically in Catholic churches in Mexico, but you can find kind of miracle charms across various cultures. And so she imagined us kind of putting these miracle charms onto the walls of the museum to ask um, for the healing of of San Francisco, of our kind of our kin. We were going, of course, through the through the protests, uh, through the Black Lives Matter protests. So it was really kind of this uh, tumultuous time. And Liz really wanted to find the space um, to ask for some type of um, miracle. So uh, we did this. And of course, because we wanted to keep everything in Spanish, that meant that I created a guide too that you could scan and that you could see the translations for that. Um, but this was part of Bay Area Walls. And then in between that too, I of course worked on a couple of um, outside projects given that you know we, we still wanted to do things. And so one of them was this project by um, two artists from Tijuana, which is the city where I'm from, Andrew Roberts and Mauricio Munoz, who are a couple and had been working um, Kind of they they ran a project space in Tijuana, um, the Slave, that was very, very important. They were showing, you know, for several years, um, kind of the most exciting projects that that I would see in that region. And so I wanted them to to work on something together. And so the project that that they made up was really beautiful because um they essentially wanted to do a musical that um, kind of had songs that, the, you know, the songs that, that would be included in this musical were pop songs, popular songs um, in Mexico that their mother sang. And, you know, they're both game players. They both kind of have online roles and um, they wanted to create kind of this, this, this musical with ogres and themselves as ogres, dressed up as ogres, because for them, ogres represented kind of the other um, the queer person, maybe the migrant. Um, and so they made this ogre really tender through the musical. And so that was kind of this little fun project that we got to work on the side. And also um, at SFOMA, going back to that, um, in the New Work Gallery as well, where the Roddy McMillan was and where we, where Angie and I worked on projects, this was with uh, Wu Sang. And um, Wu Sang wanted to create essentially a sound sculpture. And so she invited her collaborators Move by the Motion, which she has worked with across maybe from five to 10 years in various forms from, um, you know, they ran, for example, was one of the co-artistic directors of the State Theater in Zurich until recently. And they brought Move by the Motion with them. So they worked on choreographies, uh, theater plays, but also on, um, major works that were featured, for example, at the Whitney Biennial in 2022 that had to do with um, um, the, oh my gosh, Moby Dick. It was around Moby Dick. But so in this work, they wanted to kind of reconfigure it as a sound sculpture. And so with Moved by the Motion members, they created the sound piece um, that also included a text by Fred Moten. And you can see 
people were able to kind of navigate the space through these uh, these curtains that Wu created with um, with a set designer. And it was kind of a space that that we wanted to create for contemplation. And then at the same time, um, during the pandemic, we worked on conceptualizing this group show um, by artists featured in the collection and especially wanted to think about artists that were um, that were recently acquired by us, um, by, by the contemporary art department. So putting them in, con in context with artists from the collection. And so it was a fun kind of exercise to work on during the pandemic because you know, there was so much uncertainty, there was so much uncertainty about jobs, about our role as curators, again, around the role of the institution. And there was a lot of criticism specifically around SFMOMA because SFMOMA has um, uh, this longstanding collaboration with the Fisher Collection, with the Fisher family to show their, um, their collection, which included a lot of works um, by, by, um, you know, white male artists that 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 was the the focus of their collection, which of course it was a private collection. It's kind of it didn't really um, that was their specific taste and desires of acquisition. But once it goes into a public institution, it has another kind of reception and repercussion. So, you know, at that time, again, we were thinking through through the role of the institution, um, our collection itself, and trying to really look at it and look at its strong points and try to shape it, um, shape an exhibition to really show its strengths beyond kind of the, the what, what was at that time um, kind of being criticized or being visible. So we specifically showed works by um, only women. So it was 32 women artists from the collection um, that were really the works that were really dealing with this idea of impermanence also around tactility, a lot of them were sculptural because you know we saw, as we all kind of experienced during the pandemic, we were looking at so many things through the screen that it felt like we wanted something to really approach the body and tactility. And so what you see here is a combination of works by um, Shakaya Booker here on the left, um, Sharon Hayes in the back, um, and then this major kind of sculpture by Nairi Bagrami and that had been featured in Soft Power that we acquired. Um, and then we essentially put it into this, this shape because it was in a different shape during Soft Power. But that was also exciting because there were major hangs um, from the collection. Again, these are just a few shots from that, that project. Um, a work on the right by Tania Perez Cordova, uh, who's an artist that I brought into the collection. This is a window that was from the, um, a project that she did at the Tamayo Museum. So it's a window from the Tamayo Museum. Um, there's also Cynthia Marcelli on the left, and then um, Cecily Brown and uh, Diana Thader amongst um, Rachel, uh, Rachel Harrison as well. And then a Teladon, which we had done a new project with, and this was shortly before she passed away. So the the, the exhibition actually was called "Shifting the Silence," which was on her last uh, book of writing. Again, just one more shot of that, and we included also kind of a multi generational group of artists. So Liz, um, the artist that I just showed in the mural, was there with um, someone like Fiore Baez, um, and Tessa De Dean. And there was a major rehang of a work that we had acquired by Hagi Yang called Yearly Melancholy Red that included also this uh, drum set and the public could actually interact with it. And in this case, because we had just reopened, the people, uh, the public really went kind of crazy over the drum set and it was really um, fun to experience. And I also wanted to show a couple of images from the uh, artists that were featured in the biennial, you know, part of the, I am from the, like I said, I'm, I, I am from the US-Mexico border and it has been a major research interest of mine. And so during, it was really during the pandemic that um, I was approached by Adrian Edwards and David Breslin to recommend a group of artists that were working across the border because they were thinking of course through their biennial across what the border really meant. Um, how to re rethink that through through the lens of the biennial. And so they 
we did probably 15 studio visits. I did the, I, I recommended them and then we, we included three artists only, but it was really exciting to kind of be part of that, that um, process with them. And because it was all happening online, again, the research they were doing was 2020, 2021. I got to be um, in many of them, even as a translator at times. And so one of the artists that was featured is Alejandro Luperca Morales, who is from Ciudad Juarez, who created these, uh, if, if you weren't there, maybe you did see them, but if you didn't, they were essentially these um, keychains that, you know, were given to tourists at different spots. Um, you know, you would get them at the circus in Mexico, you would get them if you took a photograph outside of the Grand Canyon, you know, they were like these little um, kind of mementos that you would take from a vacation. And so he is interested in archives and in photography. And so he wanted to when during the pandemic, he was actually living in a different city, not in Juarez, and was missing home. And so was looking back at home, meaning the Juarez border and different sites across Ciudad Juarez through Google Street View. And so he captured some of these images in these keychains and created these kind of poetic texts that that um, recalled the space. Um, but also, you know, there's so many images of violence that we all maybe are familiar with um, of cross water specifically and Tijuana itself, but he wanted to kind of include these other versions of the city. So many of them were just spaces of, um, you know, these moments of passage, spaces that maybe no longer existed, that then he created an archive on Instagram where he was showing them and people from the city were adding kind of information to them, adding memories of these spaces to them. So it's really a way to rethink kind of the image of, of the city in this really intimate way um, with the public in New York that maybe had never encountered um, the city before. And then Andrew Roberts, who I showed um, as part of the Harvest Project, he also has been doing a lot of work around kind of the figure of the zombie. He works a lot with um, kind of the history of Hollywood and cinema. And so for him, the zombie figures, you know, he created these zombie figures that are workers, um, that sell workers, Walmart workers, Amazon workers. But in for him, the zombie is actually trying to regain consciousness and trying to regain their their uh, freedom. So they were included with these uh, screens and monitors, and he made also poems for them that you could listen to, as well as these sculptures that were kind of graphic, but also in a way they were zombies that were trying to advocate back for their agency. And then Monica Arriola, um, who was really interested in these specific um, housing projects called San Pedro that were in Tijuana that had this, um, that were kind of made during the Felipe Calderon presidency in 2006, that had this aspiration to kind of re reimagine the city as this new mega city, megalopolis, but during the 2008 recession really kind of were abandoned. So it's this idea of ruin, but also um, as a site of, of potential. And then going back to the projects that I did at SFMOMA, there were, um, there's a longstanding project that we do called the Secret Art Award that again is giving to Bay Area artists. And so this time it, we had skipped a year because of the pandemic and it was really uh, exciting to work on it because we were, you know, artists apply to it. Artists are recommended, certain artists apply. And then there were, I had a co-curator, Andrea Nishi Krep, who's now at the ICA London. And so we were able to review about 300 applications for artists and then go through the process of um, selecting 16 finalists and then had a committee, uh, the Sika Art Committee, where we went with them. We basically took them to each of the 16 studios. And then from there, uh, Andrea and I selected five artists to give them an exhibition at As of MoMA that also included a catalog. And so it was important at that time because a lot of, like I mentioned, there was this kind of major shift in the landscape of, of San Francisco. The economy of San Francisco, a lot of people had left, a lot of people had, had kind of stayed. And so it was important for us to review who was still there, what type of work was being made and what 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 did they want to say after, um, you know, this time of reckoning, especially with the museum um, itself. 
And so there were, again, five artists, all of them created new works. Um, it was in a really compressed amount of time. I think they had from April to December when we opened the show to work on it. So it was, again, exciting for me because we we got to work very closely with them on the project on what they wanted to do. And it was somehow easier because our installation team was in San Francisco, our registrars were in San Francisco, and we could go to the studios and really look at what the, you know, how the work was developing, really help them figure out, a lot of them were, were emerging artists, the majority of them were actually emerging artists, and it was their first major exhibition in a museum. So we worked closely with them to figure out how they wanted to hang a work, what they wanted to do, you know, how we could really kind of expand the idea in a form that that um, could be supported by by the different kind of team members at the museum. And so this was a work by Kathy Liu. This was all ceramics. And she wanted to look at uh, Nuwa, who is a Chinese creation goddess specifically, and look also at fire. Um, in San Francisco, during the pandemic, we had major, major fires. This was all over the news, so you might have seen it, that this, the, the sky for several days was completely red um, because we were surrounded by, by fire. And so she was thinking of fire and this idea of regeneration after a fire. And also thinking through um, the idea of, um, you know, there was a lot of violence uh, across the, the the across various groups, but specifically towards the Asian American community at that time, um, you know, because of the pandemic. And so there, there was a history in California of um, people setting fire to Chinatowns in San Francisco and Los Angeles um, and, and, and across the city. And at that time in 2020, 2021, a lot of this, the mayors were apologizing. So Kathy was really thinking about, you know, both that historical fire, the fires that we were experiencing because of climate change and in San Francisco, and then this idea of, of resurgence and re regeneration and renewal um, through the Chinese creation goddess. So she made this kind of major hanging of, of, of ceramics and through specific fruits. You can see more of the details here. This, these were Anua's hands that had these long nails. Um, and it was both like this kind of space of disgust and repulsion, but also um, attraction. So there's these papayas and durian and mangoes. Um, some of them rotting, some of them still um, living. And then Maria Guzman Capron, who's now going to be featured in the El Musal Barrio Triennial. So she, you'll see her work in a couple of weeks. She's creating this even larger installation. But in this one, she wanted to make this giantess also kind of descending from the earth. This is all made of fabric, um, textile. So we worked with her to really envision that and how she could hang it, um, how it could be kind of um, surrounded by the public. And then the, this was work by Marcel Pardoariza, who um, is working within the realm of photography, but also activism. And so at that time, uh, they were really thinking about the role of um, activists that were specifically focused on LGBTQ issues in San Francisco, and in a way kind of creating this altar, honoring them. And so she, um, Marcel photographed uh, 32 activists that were working again in different organizations, all the way from kind of the, the central figure is here on the left is Honey Mahogany, who actually ran for, um, for, uh, for a position within the state government. But uh, Honey Mahogany runs the Office of Transgender Initiatives within City Hall and it's the first in the country. Um, then there were also folks that were working across clinics um, and then others that were working for um, organizations that were focusing on, again, trans people that were um, in states of um, kind of a housing crisis. And so it was really kind of this beautiful way to, to again, celebrate them in a way that was immersive and compelling as well. And so this work, as well as Kathy's work, was then um, uh, entered the collection. And then this was work by uh, Gregory Reich, who had paintings and collages. 
And then this was a work. So Gregory was actually uh, an Iraq war veteran that then came back and lived in San Francisco for several years and then went to art school through the uh, through the GI Bill and um, went to Stanford and went to CCA. And so he wanted to, he often works across kind of this history of war and made this work called Charlottesville that again was uh, brought into the SFMOMA collection. And then this is one of the uh, last projects that I worked on at SFMOMA. This was something that I actually initiated before the pandemic and it was supposed to happen in 2020, but of course, happened several years later, but it was with the artist Fernando Palma Rodriguez, uh, who is an artist that I met in Mexico City many, many years before, um, who was in the Newark Gallery and wanted to create this um, installation of uh, ladder sculptures that actually moved and had the capacity to um, circle um, kind of the public or move across the space. And they specifically were moving. So he, he found a way to um, connect kind of weather patterns happening across major cities, San Francisco, Mexico City, London. Um, so both Western cities, but also cities in Latin America um, and infused kind of the, the, these weather patterns and pollution patterns with the rhythm of the, of the patterns of the movement of the sculptures. So in a way he really wanted to uh, imbue as he said, kind of nature with a voice. And so these were all, again, uh, new works that he made for the space. And they had to do with also with the four cardinal directions. The, the project was actually called Macuil Xochitl, which was uh, translates as five flowers. And it's around kind of Nawa Cosmovision um, that for them is kind of, as he explained it to me with the four cardinal directions, you really understand kind of the fabric of the, of the universe and of the world. And so they were, you know, often he works with these kind of more precarious or delicate forms of technology to really point to the, the um, kind of the role that they have, the, the role that technology has in our life, but also its fragility um, and how it's still kind of, you know, made and controlled by, by man. And then at the same time, I got to work on um, Sitting on Chrome, which was an exhibition featuring three artists that were at that base in Los Angeles, still based in Los Angeles, um, which was kind of a, a, a great project because initially it started as only inviting Rafa Sparza, um to work to essentially commission him to do a performance at, um, in relation to a mural that we had up by um, Diego Rivera, that was the Pan American Unity mural. So when we invited him to do the to do the site visit, he saw the mural, and the central figure of the mural includes uh, the Cuatlico goddess merging with the Ford stamping machine. So essentially, this is like a cyborg deity. And when Rafa saw that, he said, "You know, it's really interesting because I've been imagining a way to turn my body into a lowrider car." And I wonder if there's a possibility instead of doing a performance to do an exhibition. And I would like actually to do this exhibition with two other artists um, that have been thinking around the idea of the lowrider and the influence of lowrider culture within our work um, and our practice. And so at that time, you know, in museums, it's actually quite difficult to get an exhibition, especially one at the scale. But at that time, um, SFMOMA's new director had just started and I, you know, we pitched the show to him and he was very excited about it and put it on the calendar. So again, we had something like less than a year to make the exhibition and the artists all wanted to make new work for it. So it was my life for about eight months of intensity. Um, but in the exhibition, it was uh, Mario Ayala, Rafa Esparza and Guadalupe Rosales, like I said, and I it was both artists that I had already been looking at. So it was very exciting um, to not only be able to work with Rafa, but with Mario and Guadalupe. Um, and so they both, uh, they all wanted to create works individually, but also something together and really kind of put them, put them in dialogue with each other. And so um, on the right, you see this mural that was created by, um, that kind of just designed and envisioned by, by three of them that was imagining kind of the outside of a lowrider car and imagining kind of the viewer going into this, this exhibition space, but really as a ride. 
And so you can see details here. There was a photograph um, by Guadalupe Rosales, uh, a painting um, by Mario Ayala that he did directly on the wall, and then a, a drawing by uh, Rafa Esparza. And you can see something kind of similar now. Um, Guadalupe just, or Lupe just made a really beautiful mural that's outside of storefront for art and architecture. So if you're in New York, you will be able to see it. It's really pink and bright and beautiful. Um, and it's there for two years. So if you cross there, you will see it. But this was all, um, I mean, this mural probably took the longest to do because it was made um, by hand. Everything is made by hand. So you see silver leaf kind of uh, petals that were placed here. Um, all of this kind of um, the paint on the wall, obviously, but the there's also um, ballpoint pen and um, silver um, lining um, that was made by Lauren D'Amato, who's now actually an artist featured in the Sika Art Award um, that will have an exhibition at the end of the year. And then the artist also wanted to create a sound sculpture that they had never done before. Um, and they wanted to kind of evoke the sensation of being inside of the car. So they made this uh, work together um, that was uh, featured kind of a soundtrack of songs that they would listen to while riding in cars with their families or with their friends. And this is a work um, kind of evoking that to that sensation by, by Lupe Rosales. And this was the entrance to the show. Um, this had again, pinstriping, uh, hand, hand drawn pinstriping by Lauren D'Amato. Um, cruising in California had only been decriminalized a year before. So it kind of, we wanted to play with that and there were certain you know effects of that going on throughout the space. And then this is work by Mario Ayala. Mario Ayala actually studied at the SFAI in San Francisco. So he had a really important connection to the Bay. And he said that the first car, um, the first, you know, pre the first Prius that he ever saw was in San Francisco. And so he imagined maybe in the future that the low riders of the future would be Priuses. And so made this painting um, with the Prius. And then this was the kind of the sculpture that Rafa got into to transform into a low rider. And we were able to bring this down to the Diego Rivera mural and he performed in it as um, kind of a cyborg from the future. He also made a new painting. This was again, pinstriping on the wall um, by Lauren D'Amato. And then another view of that with a photograph by Guadalupe Rosales in the back here was the sound sculpture. And then they wanted to create a space again that would feel as though you were inside of the car. So we created um, with this uh, kind of designer who actually works on, on low rider cars in San Francisco. All of this was a fabric, velvet fabric a wall. And then this was a new work by Lupe and a new work by Rafa that was a um, image of his niece uh, playing with the low rider because of so, so much of it is intergenerational and is passed on through through families. And then that was kind of my time in San Francisco. I just started my role um, at Sculpture Center this January. So I've been in the role now for eight months and different to uh, San Francisco where there were 20 curators in the, in the curatorial department, I am the only curator at Sculpture Center. So it's really um, exciting because I get to really shape the program with my team, which is uh, Saurabh Mohebi, who's our director, who used to be the curator, but is now our director, and Kyle Dansowicz, who's our deputy director, um, who has been at Sculpture Center for many years. So it's it's really kind of important uh, because both of them have a, a lot of um, kind of experience with the building and with the history of the institution that I get to kind of come in and work with them. And so jumping into it, there were um, a couple of gaps on the calendar. One was for this summer, where we're trying to really work with artists um, in that space. I don't know if anybody knows uh, Sculpture Center. If you haven't, please do come visit. We actually have an opening tonight um, from six to eight with Alvaro Urbano and Bastien um, Gachette. So please join us. Um, but if you've been to the building, it's this really kind of beautiful industrial building from 1907 that used to be a trolley repair station and had kind of different a different life also before we entered it in the 2000s. But the the kind of the top space has these really 
high ceiling, um, you know, kind of this dramatic um, roof. Um, and then the lower level is more, a little bit more like a bunker, like a um, kind of this maze that is um, lowered ceiling. And so in that space, we're really trying to think through practices with artists that maybe have some type of um, dialogical capacity with the public, that have maybe some type of um, kind of public engagement, or also really just invite artists that are working through an idea. So not necessarily a residency because we don't have the space for that, but but invite someone uh, who wants wants to work on a new new project. And so for the summer, we I worked with Alexa West, who is an artist that studied sculpture at, at Bard, but runs a performance space, a dance space in uh, Brooklyn called Pageant. And so she both inhabits kind of the dance world and the sculpture world. And, you know, I invited her to do a project over the summer and she said yes immediately, which was really exciting because not, you know, not everybody has the space and the time to do that, but we gave her resources and gave her two months to really do whatever she wanted. And so she wanted to look back at the, um, um, the Balanchine Ballet uh, Orpheus that was, uh, the set design was created by Isamu Noguchi and rethink it through the perspective of Eurydice, who, you know, Orpheus is trying to rescue from hell, but in her version, Eurydice actually wants to stay in hell because she's, as Alexa described her, she's kind of a party girl that doesn't want to leave. And so she created this uh, performance that we had open rehearsal. So essentially the public was always invited to see Alexa and her dancers rehearsing this piece. And then at the end, we made these open rehearsals that the public was invited to to um, present in. So it was really, um, yeah, like a great project for for her thinking through the space, the architecture of the space and a new idea. And then this is a project that I have coming up next month. Again, you're invited to come to the opening. It will be on October 30th. And it is with a duo from Mexico City called Asma. This is not a work, they're creating new work. So I'm, I'm not showing any of that yet because it's still, as of right now, uh, they're very much in the middle of the process, but um, this is by a, a, a project that they did recently in Mexico City, um, where they created kind of this, um, yeah, large scale sculpture um, in brass that was featured a lot of um, kind of um, found materials that they that they wanted to include, and so in their sculpture center project when I've known them for several years and have um, been very interested in their work, but it was someone that we could never really show at SFMOMA. You know, major institutions really want artists that have a track record of exhibition history and it's harder to pitch uh, more emerging artists, but at Sculpture Center, that's a big focus of ours. So I'm really excited about that. And Asma um, told me, you know, we really love the basement. We have an idea for the basement. You know, could we could we do something there? And so we invited them to to the lower level, and they're really thinking through the figure of the doll uh, within kind of times of war and times of um, crises. Um, how the doll and you know dolls have been these sites of projection, and especially right now as we're going through you know, several crises and several wars, um, how this this kind of fragmentation of the body, of the doll, um, how that can manifest. And so the they're creating the kind of thinking of the lower level as a space of the subconscious and will kind of create these four scenes with dolls um, and with this idea of fragmentation and desire and sound. So please come by. Um, you know, the way that, that we're thinking through the program too has to do with or the way that I'm uh, thinking through it is around um, the body interaction, maybe with sculpture and the body expanded forms of sculpture. Uh, you know, sculpture is our departure point, but we of course focus on many other forms um, and practices we're really interested to and kind of um, material histories, um, what that means right now, certain urgencies across artists working internationally, but also locally. And, you know, one of the, things that I will also focus on at Sculpture Center is our in-practice program, which has been running for about 20 years. And historically, it was a group show that would happen in the lower level, but in the past two years with our new director, he wanted to emphasize um, kind of the capacity for a solo show for artists. So now we are 
uh, doing six solo shows a year for the Impractice Artists. And currently we had 1400 artists apply for the Impractice program. So I'm going through the applications right now with my team and we start to review those applications uh, together and with the panel in a couple of weeks. And then we'll make a selection of 16 finalists and then do studio visits with all of them and then select six. So it's really exciting because we get to work on um, kind of these major exhibitions on the ground floor, these um, more kind of open process, dialogical practices in the lower level and then our in-practice artists um, upstairs as well. So please come by. It's going to be an exciting time uh, at Sculpture Center. And with that, I will end for now. Great. Thank you so much, Giovanna. So there are a couple of questions, Wonderful. which I, I will read. So the okay. first one is, have you uh, worked with or know of any artists who want to express their art across many more than one medium, e.g. physical and digital or 2D and immersive that share the same provenance rights are the same piece of art, even though they are two separate entities. So I guess that's a question about interdisciplinarity. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting because that's, you know, when when I arrived to SFMOMA with this contemporary art department, there were a lot of people that were very confused, especially other curators, because they were working on contemporary art, um, you know, in their departments. But our, our and I think my my, my position on this too is that artists now, especially contemporary artists, are working across so many different mediums. I mean, it's not so so I think the idea of medium specificity within institutions will will shift very soon because it's not it's no longer that artists are only working in photography or only working in painting and sculpture, that they really are working um you know, what, what the project kind of needs maybe will be a sculpture, maybe is a painting, maybe it's a combination of the two. And actually what's really interesting about the question of provenance is maybe I'll point to this work by Wu Sang, Moby Dick, because, Mo because Moby Dick, Wu created it as, um, there's several versions of it. So one version is kind of the theater play that is, uh, that was in Zurich um, when she was artistic director there, that is, you know, a play more traditional. Then she actually made a film that was then, um, the film part was then um, played live by a symphony. And so that played in Venice. I saw that in Venice. I also saw it in uh, at Stanford. And then a version of that was then made into kind of a um, unity work made with um, like a game engine that she showed at the Venice Biennial and was acquired by SFOMA and was actually shown at the ICA Boston recently. That was um, kind of this game engine work that she made from the perspective of the whale. So there was the the film version that was you know musical. There was the game engine version that was from the perspective of the whale. And then there was the version that was at the Whitney Biennial that was more like a like a shorter film made uh, with like a tilted platform, um, so more like immersive sculptural uh, space. So it was fascinating because for Wu, it's like this project was so um, like it was so vast that she actually had to express it across so many different uh, forms, and you know it complicates the idea of provenance because what is actually the original, what is what is the authentic part of it? And I actually find that very exciting. Um, the artists are really working through, um, again, different different mediums. And I hope, and I do think that, that this notion of medium specificity will really, really shift mm. uh, very soon. Okay. Next. Um... Thanks for this program. It seems like many of the artists that you work with are emerging. Can you talk about how an artist is found or seen when you're thinking about work for new projects? Also, is it possible, advisable for artists to apply to curators directly? Yeah, you know, this is something that I'm doing right now because I'm working on a group show for next year um, at Sculpture Center. And it's something that I that I do, uh, I do a lot of studio visits obsessively. I mean, I think that that's something that we, that's part of the fun part of being a curator is that we get to really talk to artists, go to their studios, look at a practice as it's kind of taking shape or work taking shape. And then I, when I travel, for example, I also, you know, 
luckily I got to travel a lot this year alone. I've been to Mexico, Dominican Republic. I've been to Korea, um, you know, Europe. And what I do always is I ask for recommendations from colleagues, from other artists. So when I went to Korea, I asked a lot of artists that I, that I trust that I've worked with for their recommendations. I asked for colleagues across other institutions that I know kind of their, their practices or their interests. I asked them for recommendations. And I do the same when a colleague asks me for recommendations for a city or for a place. Um, I give them a list of places they should go to, artists they should meet, um, you know, so it starts there and I now I'm based in New York, which is really great because I get to go see shows all the time. So, you know, our our museum has a practice that we try to do that on Fridays we go see shows. You know, Fridays is dedicated to going to see uh, gallery exhibitions or studio visits um, or museums. So that's constant. Um, that's part of curatorial work again, that I find exciting, but that you have to kind of keep nurturing uh, everywhere you go. And I do think that artists write me. Um, they and I, and I really appreciate it, actually, when artists intentionally, you know, look at my work and say, oh, this actually fits because of this, this, this. My, my work, you know, as an artist is dealing with these topics and I see that you've done this show, you know, would you be interested in this? When I get a random artist writing that has doesn't even know, you know, what I've done, the institution where I work with, what we show. Um, so I, I think if you're gonna write a curator, just be intentional about it and, um, you know, try to really connect why your practice might make sense um, for them in a way. That would be my recommendation. Great. Um, next, could you share a detailed step-by-step -step breakdown of how you transform an initial concept into a fully realized exhibition and outline the key roles involved throughout the development? Of course, we don't have another hour. <laughs> I'll give a, I'm, I'm, I just had to do this yesterday. So it's fresh on my mind because I'm, I'm working with an artist uh, from Brazil who's going to make a show in the ground floor space. So it's it's a it's a big space. And you know, it has a different um uh yeah, just capacity, you know, for what she needs to do. So the first thing I do is obviously you have many conversations with the artists. Um and then you invite them to do a site visit because it's it's a commission, they really need to look at the space. So once they do a once they do the site visit, we spend a lot of time in the building. We look at architectural plans. We look at the SketchUp. You know, we try to feel the space together and alone. I, I always give them space alone um, to really kind of spend time there. And then from there, I ask them for several things. One of them is a conceptual description of the project. So they have to describe in in a couple of paragraphs what they're imagining conceptually. You know, what they envision. Second is a physical and material description of the project. So with drawings, with plans, with anything that they can help us, both me as a curator, but my team, the installation team, the development team that has to also fundraise for it, uh, really envision it. So we ask for dimensions, materials, um, drawings, anything that, that will help us kind of envision it. And then finally for a budget. You know, because with commissions, we often assign various budgets to to the projects and artists have to know how to make a budget. You know, they have to really understand what they're going to spend money on if they need money on materials, on fabrication, on assistance, on travel to do research somewhere where they want to go. And so they have to give us a breakdown of that budget. And then from there, we have a conversation as a team where I can say, okay, this might be feasible, this might not be feasible. And then we have a conversation with the artists and again, kind of go through each of the points that they want to accomplish um, and what we can do. Because often, you know, I ask artists to go big, to, to imagine something, you know, um, really not impossible but imagine something big you know because it, it, be ambitious about it and us too as creators like let's let's be ambitious together and from there we have to really realize what what is physically possible what is uh, materially possible and what is actually financially possible um, with the budget that we have so that's kind of how i go about it and then throughout the process i have monthly meetings with artists often they include the team often not i'm also always kind of in touch with them you know asking for updates asking for photographs asking um you know to to see progress photos of the work and how it's going okay two more um a quick one was rodney mcmillan's mural applied directly to the wall 
No, sorry, that was actually a scroll. It was a painting. Um, and so that was uh, similar. He then did one for the 2022 Whitney Biennial. I don't know if you were there, but it was the column. He made a large scale painting for that. And so it is a painting across, uh, I think it's maybe 70 feet, 75 feet. And we acquired that work. So if anybody wants to show it, it is at Asafoma and is dying to leave uh, storage. Okay. And last, um, a very practical, how much do the artists get paid to participate? What part does the museum cover? Are the commissions and the work by the museum the same for each artist? So it's, it's different. Um, at SF MoMA, for example, um, you know, museums are only now sta creating a standard for what they pay artists, which is kind of shocking, but it is uh, finally getting, um, like, again, more standardized, following wage practices, but also different um, kind of capacities of the museum. So when I arrived, SFOMA did not have uh, a specific number that they would give artists. And this, this was a um, conversation that we had across the institution to really make that a standard. Um, so, for example, um, at SFOMA, a new work exhibition, which is maybe like a, a big commission, but in a not so big of a room, uh, the artists, I think, would get uh, something like $5,000 as, as an artist fee and then maybe 15 to 20 um, for production. So for soft power, it was a little bit different because there were 20 artists, there were 20 commissions. So I think each of them exactly got maybe the 5K and that's where we started to standardize it. And something close to 15 each for the commission because we wanted to be it to be equal across all the artists and um you know some artists maybe needed a little bit more a little bit less so it balanced out but it was across that number and at sculpture center because we have different um different um kind of spaces that also varies but um yeah there there is a standard and you know, some museums don't do that. And it really is something that as curators um, and as artists, we really need to advocate for because there should be a standard to pay artists um, for a, a, a fee to participate in a group show, in a, even if they're loaning a work or a new kind of commissioned uh, exhibition, artists should always get paid. So that should, that is really something that we, we, we need to advocate for um, if it doesn't, if it's not an institution, if it's not a practice there. Mm. Well, that's what wage is about, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so with that, um, you passed your oral exam. <laughs> we'll we'll end here. Thanks so Sorry much. Sorry that I couldn't see who's there, but thank you all for coming. Whoever is still there, I hope it was um, fun. <laughs> it, it was, and so Giovanna, we'll see you in a moment. Uh, okay, great. Students, all right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.